Okay, please open your Bibles with me this morning to James chapter 2, and we are going to continue on with the study of our justification. And for many weeks now, actually probably about four or five weeks, we have been learning together what the Bible teaches in regards to our justification. Uh, the term justification is a legal definition describing a transaction that is made from one on behalf of another to make them right or to, to uh, pay for their penalty. And the word justification means to be set right before God. And that's really the question that is at hand, is how is a man to be right before God? A lot of religions in the world serving different types of gods have their own means by where men can be made right by whatever God they deem to worship. We know there's only one true living God. And Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And we've learned now that justification is that we now have the imputed righteousness of Christ. We are in right standing with God. But how did that happen? The Apostle Paul uh, has taught us over and over in the New Testament about how we are justified. In fact, we know that all the way back in Genesis, we learned that God's plan has always been justification being set right before God by faith and by faith alone. That is how we are justified, that we are not justified by works. We are justified solely by faith in Christ. That is how we are made right before God. And so we're going to continue on with this study as we learn more about our justification. And our hope is that when we finish this and we're nearing the end of this, that you will know exactly how you are made right before God in justification, in your salvation, but also the security uh, that comes with our justification before God, that you can live a life in security knowing why you are right before God. And it's solely based upon our faith. And so we establish this already through Scripture um, and in Romans 3, 20 through 26, we talked about this um, a few times, but let me read this to you before we get into James chapter 2. And it's important that we read this because once we reach James chapter 2, those of you that have studied this, the Word of God for any length of time, you know that James chapter 2 is one of the most um, debated passages of Scripture in the Bible. In fact, for generations, this particular book in the Bible has been disputed, has been argued, and frankly, by some theologians, has in, even been disputed to even say that it shouldn't be a part of Scripture, because when you read chapter 2, it appears as if there is a great contradiction on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. In fact, Martin Luther himself, in the early years of his conversion, even said that when he studied James, it troubled his mind so much that he actually believed that it was something that should be kicked out of the Word of God. But we know that the Word of God is all in cohesiveness. It is, it is never contradictory. We understand that. So today, as we enter into chapter 2, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture that has been greatly debated by many, many, many theologians and Christians throughout the, the era of time. And we're going to learn what the Bible teaches and what James was speaking about. And we know that it was not in contradiction to what the Apostle Paul taught um, by justification being by faith alone in Christ alone. So let's see what Paul the Apostle had to say real quick as we begin. In Romans 3, 20 through 26, Paul says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight. In other words, nobody can keep the law, and by works of the law will never be justified in the sight of God. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin, simply the, the law taught us what sin was. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Aren't you thankful for the gift of God in Christ Jesus? It is an absolute gift. Um, it's something that God gave freely to each and every one who will believe and receive this gift. 
And it says, moving along, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What an incredible truth that that is. Likewise, in Romans chapter 4, as we're going to learn as we dive into the second chapter of James here, um, he's going to talk to us about our faith and about the demonstration of true faith in works. And in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul the Apostle, writing here once again, says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, going all the way back to the very, very beginning of the Jewish nation, the Israelites, starting with Abraham? And Paul goes back there as he's speaking to Jews, and then he's also speaking to Gentiles, and we know that he takes them all the way back to the father of their faith, the very foundation. For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Just simply that. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, we could spend a lot more time going through many more passages of scripture and many of them we already have looked at in the past several weeks. Uh, But for the sake of time this morning, let's begin in chapter 2 of James. Follow along with me, and we're going to start in verse 14, and we're going to read through the rest of uh, the chapter. And listen to what James now begins to describe as he now is speaking about faith. And something you need to know and understand as we study the Word of God, just using simple biblical hermeneutics, the art and science of studying Scripture and interpreting Scripture, is we need to understand, number one, let's look at this, who's the audience that James is writing to? There are actually three options of who wrote James, uh, really only one contender, Um There are many that believe the author of James, although he didn't give himself this kudo, that this James writing this is not James, uh, the the son of Zebedee, um, but this is actually not one of the apostles. This is James, the half-brother of Christ, writing this letter. There are those that believe that this is the author here of James. And listen to what he says in James 1. We mentioned this last week briefly, but I want you to understand this. In order to grasp what James is getting at, we need to look here at the very beginning. And it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings, he says. So James here is writing now to the 12 tribes of Israel that are outside of the commonwealth, if you will, of Jerusalem. Of, of, of the, the land. They're living outside of that. They're part of the dispersion that has never come back home to the land. And so James is writing now to Jews. That's who he is speaking to. And he's writing to Jews in order that you understand why there's so much Jewish terminology in here. There's a reason for that because James, a Jew, is writing to Jewish brothers. That's who he's writing this letter to, that they would receive this letter and they would read this letter. And now James is going to begin to explain to them um, in more detail as he now addresses something that has the greatest value for every single person who is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, And that is, guess what? That is your faith. Your faith is of great value. Extremely, extremely important. And in fact, if you read uh, what, first, what Peter says in First Peter about our faith, um, there's something very, very important that he says. Let me read this to you quickly as we make our way through this. Peter writes in First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by grace, excuse me, who by God's power are being guarded through faith, for a salvation ready to be received in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
Guess how precious your faith is? More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. What is Peter telling those that he's writing to there? He says, your faith is of more value than what the earth puts the most emphasis of value on in the reality of where we live in real time and space. The most valuable thing that you have are not your assets. The most valuable thing, Peter says, is your faith. And the way that our faith is demonstrated in its, its um, genuineness is through something that he mentions here called trials or testing. That How many of you have had your faith tested? It doesn't take you long for your faith to be tested when you come to faith in Christ, does it? And there's a reason for that, because the testing of our faith is very, very important, because the testing of faith, it demonstrates the genuineness of our faith. And you know what it does in turn? Is it encourages me. Not only does it encourage me, but it also encourages others. And so when you get to James chapter 1, he's also writing like Peter, but he's writing here to the 12 tribes. And look what he says in verse 2 of chapter 1. He says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials. Here's that word again that Peter just talked about in First Peter. When you face trials of many kinds. Here it is. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you become what complete mature lacking nothing so James as he begins his letter to these Jews he starts out with the testing of their faith And that the faith that they have in the testing of the trials of life that they were enduring was going to bring about something for them that is far greater than any earthly thing. It is something that is eternal. It is their salvation. That the testing of their faith was producing something in them that no worldly thing could offer them. No religious system can provide this for them. No steps of works can bring this to them. It is through the testing of their faith that something is developed and strengthened in our faith that is so important for the life of every single believer. We don't necessarily like testing But James, starting out writing to those brothers of his in the dispersion outside of Jerusalem there, he is writing to them to explain to them about their faith and the testing that their faith is experiencing. And why is it so important that God, in his own sovereignty, allows us to be tested, our faith to be tested, because it produces something. It builds something up in us that's very valuable and very important. And so he begins with that. He's not saying they don't have faith. He's saying that, listen, the faith you have is being tested by trials in life, but it's going to bring about something for your benefit. And it is the steadfastness that you are going to have, that it brings about this perfecting and this completeness and this maturity that our faith would be mature. That's what we are really after. And then when you get into chapter 2, he then begins to talk about um, these different things like, okay, let's let's look at this demonstration here. Now we've talked about your faith. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not denying the fact that they have faith. He's speaking about their faith. And he's trying to let them know something that's incredible about our faith that is for their benefit here. 
He's not speaking about the fact that they don't have faith. He's going to talk about now something of their faith and about their faith and, and what's going on with the testing and the trials and what God is doing in their life, in their faith, as they hold to the faith they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you get into the 14th, as we go down through this section, let's begin. And this is a great question I think a lot of people have. What good is it, my brothers, he says, not denying their faith, but he says, what good is it, brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but does not have works? James is not saying that their faith is, is the works of their faith is what saved them. He's asking a question here. This is a hypothetical question, a real question, probably a question that you and I both have. And he asks the question, what good is our faith if it's not accompanied by a demonstration of that faith? What is it? How does it benefit you and how does it benefit a world or the body of Christ or the world that's lost in darkness without the gospel that has penetrated them? By the way, they have no ability to do any works that please God. It's impossible, right? And he says, there, what good is it if you just say you have faith, but it's not demonstrated by the works of your faith? And he says, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, and lacking in daily food. And one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? He's not denying the fact that they have faith. He's asking them a real question. And it's a question for all of us. If we see someone, a brother or sister who is in need, in genuine need, and all we do is say, hey, have a super day. God bless you. What did your faith in Christ do to bring about any change or any goodness to that individual? Didn't really do anything at all, did it? And so he's saying, listen, I understand the fact that you have faith, but your faith if we're looking at not our justification before God here, but our demonstration of our faith for others, he says, what good is it if you just tell somebody, hey, I wish you well, go on your way, when you actually have the ability to do something in order to help that individual who is in need? It's far greater if you were to take that person a meal, if they needed something to eat, or if they, whatever their need would be to actually meet their need. Very important for us to do that as the body of Christ, right? And then he moves on in, uh, says this. In verse 17, now listen. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? He says dead, right? That's what he says. Faith without works is dead, now, the Greek word that's used here is, is not the word rendered as in corpse. The word here used in the Greek means useless. It, it's futile. In other words, you can have all kinds of knowledge, but if you don't apply that knowledge, your knowledge is useless, he says, right? In Romans chapter 1, speaking of those uh, who, who have all kinds of knowledge, but it doesn't bring them to the saving faith of Christ, that knowledge doesn't mean a thing at all. And it's right here the same exact way the word dead here, the, the, the Greek word here talks about that it's fruitless, it is useless, it's not bringing any fruit to the table, it's not providing absolutely anything for anyone else, nor even for yourself. He says it's, it's useless. Now we know that our justification before God in position has been settled by faith alone. That's how it has been settled, and we know that. There's no question, there's no debate about that. And I told you that we are going to stay on the ridge of the Word of God. We are not going to go to the right and we're not going to go to the left, as many people do. They go too far left and they go too far right. Not necessarily speaking in conservativeness, in our culture today, I don't think you can go far enough to the right in the world in which we live in. We know we've gone too far to the left and we've just begun. But listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verses 8. Follow along with me if you would. 
For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Aren't you glad for that? It is the gift of God, not a result of works, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No boasting is going to happen in the presence of God based on how good you thought you were. It's not going to happen because your salvation is only solely based on the work that Christ Jesus finished on the cross of Calvary. That is it. No work will get there. But then listen to what he goes on and says. For we are Christ's workmanship. We're his workmanship. What is he doing? He is working in us and through us. He is what? Taking us from the point of our justification to the point of our glorification. And in the middle of it all, Christ is what? He is bringing about our sanctification. He is the one, the author, it says, and the perfecter of our faith. We are his workmanship. Do you understand why you're now experiencing testing of your faith? Because you are his workmanship. And it's the testing of your faith that is more valuable than gold, more valuable than the priceless things of this world. Your faith being tested by God, allowing you to experience the trials of life, is doing something far greater for you than anything that ever could be provided for things of this world. And Christ is doing this. You are his workmanship. And we are experiencing these things called life. That's why when you hear this gospel that's not true about how everything in life will be nothing but red roses and you name it, it's all going to be great. That's not the gospel. No, it's the testing of your faith that is producing in you perseverance and perseverance must finish its work. Why? Because God wants us to grow up into him who is the head, Christ himself. And it's that working in you that brings about this faith that is mature and is growing. That's why when we get here to Abraham's story, what I love about what James has done, James has gone to the very end here, years down the life of Abraham. And what is God doing? God tested Abraham during that. And what did he do? He proved and showed Abraham not only for him, but we're here in 2020 and still reading about the act of faith that Abraham showed and demonstrated in order that we would understand what genuine faith looks like. It's incredible. What an amazing God we serve So it's not a result of works. No one's going to boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Created in Christ Jesus. Guess what? For good works. For good works. Which God prepared beforehand. Listen to this word. That we should walk in them. Do you know what you are simply doing from your justification to your glorification? It's called your walk. It's walking through this life, a new creation. And now you're walking in something you couldn't walk in when you were dead in your sins and your trespasses. Now and only now by the Holy Spirit living in and through you, are you able now to do anything of any work for the King of glory? How incredible is this that you and I have been invited into this incredible calling of God that we are the body of Christ here upon the earth. And we now get to be used by God in demonstration of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in acknowledging that the law is good, that we can't keep it, and we repent and turn to Christ. And by faith in Him, we are justified before God. We are regenerated. We are made new in Christ Jesus. We are filled with the Spirit of God. And now, for the first time in your life, you see things in a whole new world. And for the first time in your life now, you are actually able by the power of the Spirit of God to operate in the works that God had prepared beforehand that you would walk in. 
You couldn't do that in the flesh. Those are things done of the Spirit of God. And now we are simply walking out our sanctification, growing more and more like God. And now we are what? We are being used by God as the hands and feet of Christ upon the earth. That's what we are. When Jesus saw a need, what did he do? He met the need. That's what we do as the body of Christ. We see needs, we should meet those needs. And so this is what's absolutely beautiful about what what James is getting at here. It looks like we're going to have to go one more week. But anyway, let me let me finish this just a little bit longer and we'll we'll wrap up here. And then he says this. So we know that so also in verse 17 faith by itself if it does not have works is it's useless. It's not bringing about um the purposes, not our justification here, our justification's been settled. That's all over with, done, and complete. But there's something now that's, that's happening. Now our faith is being tested, it's being, it's being stretched, and we are growing in Christ. And now, because of the Holy Spirit, we're walking now in the works that God prepare, prepared beforehand that we would walk in. Do we do that all the time? No. Do we do it perfectly? No. Does that mean we'll lose our salvation? Absolutely, T, totally no. Our position is finalized in the one act of justification that took place the moment you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how you were justified before God. But now we have this privilege in the power of God working through us and walking in obedience to the, to the Spirit of God as the body of Christ on the earth, being His representatives, His ambassadors, and now we get to go into this world and show people how Jesus Christ lives. It's amazing. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Now let me say this. Works without faith is useless. There is a lot of people in religion, and we're going to close here. I've said this over and over, and I want you to get this. There are lots of religions who will even call themselves by the name of the umbrella Christ. The problem is their gospel is false. It is wrong. And Satan, I told you, could not prevent Christ from making a way for men to be made right with God. So Satan has perverted the only means by where we might be saved. And so people that have heard the very beginning of justification by faith, they understand that, but then there's the big but put in there. And now the but means that they must what put it all into the steps of what's required for them to be right before God. The problem is, how many stinking steps are there in order for you to think you could be justified before God? Some of them say there's seven. Really? How do you figure that? What if there's 29 and you did seven? You don't have an ounce of hope. See, the problem is with our justification about works, what is enough, man? Isn't that the real question? How is a man to be right before God? Oh, well, we got to do baby, blah, 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 blah. Well, what if they're wrong? You should have done this many. Sorry, it eh, didn't make it. No, Jesus Christ did all the work. Do you see what he says? He did it all. That's why on the cross of Calvary, he said, it is finished. It is finished. What? The whole system of sacrifice and getting right before God, atoning for sin, all of that is finished. Jesus says, it is all done, and I accomplish this through my blood. Dear Christian, oh, the joy of your salvation is incredible. It's incredible that you walk before God, not because of your works and how good you keep it all, but because Jesus Christ did it all perfectly before God. And we, in faith, are in Christ. Do you see how beautiful that is? And now because we are in Christ, and now because we have been made new, Now we have the ability to do what James is going to talk about here. Now we have ability to walk this out in demonstration of a new life in Christ Jesus. 
Oh, God is so good. Let's close there today. And we'll try to wrap this up next Sunday. If you're here this morning and you have been brought low by this virus, and many of you have been, and you've been struggling and concerned, and maybe you're watching this morning at home, uh, maybe you're listening on the radio this morning, and you just don't have an ounce of hope. You, you look at the situation, the climate of our country, the world, everything that's going on, and you absolutely understand that there's not much hope and faith in what's going on in this world. Listen, the truth is, that's by design. There is only one place that we can put our faith and trust and have any hope in this life, and his name is Jesus Christ. That is our only hope. And so if you're watching or listening or you're here this morning, maybe you've tried religion. Listen, we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about a real relationship with a God that created you. That's what we're looking at. And there's a way in which a man might be right before God, and it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And by faith in him, you can be saved today if you will trust in the finished work of Christ. Religion will not get you there. There, although we're going to vote, and I'm encouraging every single person that hears me this morning, we need to vote. Get out and vote this year. There are a lot of things at stake in this nation this year. We need to vote. But listen to me. My sole hope is not in this country. My hope is in Jesus. My hope is in Christ. And for you this morning, if you've trusted in the works of religion, listen to me, you've done nothing more than exactly what Paul says in Galatia, that you have sunk yourself into a false gospel. If you're working your way to God, sorry, you will never reach the top of the stairs no matter what the church tells you. Jesus Christ climbed the hill of Golgotha, and he, and he alone, made a way for man to be right with God. Put your trust in Jesus today. Not in religion, not in works, not in goodness, but only in Christ. Lord Jesus, this morning as we close in prayer, if there's anyone here in this, in this place that has absolutely no assurance of their salvation, they just don't even know how they can know for sure that they're saved. It's because they don't truly fully understand that their justification before you has come solely as a gift of grace and mercy and their faith that they have provided in giving that to Christ. They just simply believe in Jesus. I believe, Jesus, you've done it, you finished it, and that settled it. And Lord, you can regenerate them and make them a new creation in Christ Jesus at the very moment that they truly believe in you, God. Simply faith. And Lord, if there's anyone here that they're just not there, I pray that they'll go to the prayer room, even now as I pray, that they'll seek and ask someone to help them understand, and they'll pray and, and make sure that they know that they're right with Christ. Maybe they're here and they're religious and they showed up today because it was just something that they thought they might want to check off their list. And oh God, it's not about a list. It's about a Savior, and His name is Jesus. It's about a gift, and it's called grace. Oh, God, thank you so much for your love. And so, Lord Jesus, today we find joy in our salvation. Oh, God, and now what a privilege we have as we walk in step with the Spirit of God, now in doing our work of love for you, Christ, not for justification, but out of an overflow of overwhelming love and gratitude for this incredible gift that we didn't do anything to deserve or merit. Father, thank you today. We love you. We pray these things in the precious, powerful name of Christ. Amen. Amen.